Today, uh, we want to talk kind of through the more complexity of, of a V-Ray material. Um, we, we obviously, we worked with some of the basic materials. We used some of the materials and kind of evaluated how they were being created. Today, we're going to talk about how do materials end up having texture. And I think one of the important things to recognize is that if you want to model something with texture in, in Rhino, you, you have really two ways of doing it. One, you could model, like let's say a shingle wall, for example, or a brick wall. You could model each individual brick in the wall and texture map each one and then build it that way. Or you could model a wall, like a, a plane, a surface, and apply a material on it that looks like a bunch of individual bricks or looks like a bunch of individual singles. And the texture itself can have that relief to it to make it look realistic. And so today we're going to talk through how that kind of a texture is made up um, and then I'm going to have you make up some so that you can uh, learn. I have two different parts in the, um, the exercise today. If you went through my 135, I'm going to ask you to do something that's a little bit more complicated because it involves some Photoshop, but it would be a good, um, it's a good practice on your part. If you did not go through my 135 or don't feel comfortable with the Photoshop part, you don't have to do that. You can work with uh, some of the other preset strategies that I'll show you about. So you're, you're more than welcome to go through that. If you did go through my 135, I'd like you to do one of your materials completely from scratch. And then the rest of them, you can do them like everybody else. Um, but it'll give you more practice if you go through it that way. Um, and I'm going to demo that part at the end today. That'll be my last thing. So if you don't feel comfortable in Photoshop, you can kind of tune me out and not listen to me go through that part of it. Uh, but there comes a point when you're modeling where sometimes you just can't find that material you need. I need that material. I can't find it online. I have to figure out how to create that material from scratch. And so that's really what today becomes about is how do you create something entirely from scratch. So let's talk about what makes up a material in the first place. So I'm going to work with, um, let me go ahead and I'm going to reset the, uh, the render settings in this to see if I can't um, get it to show up a little bit better here. Um, let's go into our render mode. Yeah, see, this is the problem. My demo is completely black. Uh, let me turn off the... And then get rid of that sun here and let's see if it, ah, it's a little bit better uh, because it'll help me kind of illustrate the point. What I have here is I have a sphere that's sitting on top of a, a cube. There's nothing fancy about it. You can make your own. Um, the, the key here is that I'm going to be able to investigate what's happening, especially right along these edges um, as we start to apply some materials. Um, so the first material that I'm going to apply is, is just for demo purposes so I can kind of explain how this process works, uh, is a material that uh, I created a while back based on uh, an image file. And if you want any of these, if you go into the downloadable resources, resource packages, um, there is a zip file of a bunch of these materials. Let's see, it is there. This is old. This is for V-Ray 1.6. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to, to download this because it's not necessarily relevant, but it's a good illustration of how this stuff uh, works. So the, the file that I'm, I'm creating here is a file that is just like a shingle wall texture, like a wood shingle wall texture. Um, let me go ahead and I'm going to open the uh, material rather than create it from scratch, just so I can illustrate some points here. Let me go ahead and uh, import a material here. All right, and I'm going to do a couple things first. You don't have to pay attention to what it is that I'm doing, but I'm going to take that material and I'm going to apply it to this cube and this sphere. So I'll just click on both of those. I held down shift while I did it and I'll right click on the shingle siding and say uh, apply to selection. And so now I have the shingle siding applied to it. So this shingle siding is actually made up of a bunch of individual image files. And the best way for me to explain it is I have a little graphic that's here in Photoshop that talks about how this stuff comes together. So the image that's on top right here is a photograph of a shingle wall. 
So somebody went out and they took a photograph, hopefully with nice even lighting, and then they took that photograph in, in a program like Photoshop and they made it so that it was a tiling image, so that one side connects to the other and you could repeat it in, indefinitely in any direction. So the pattern repeats itself. And so if I take that file and I make a material using that as my diffuse map, I end up with something that looks like this, which as we look at this, looks reasonable because it looks like there's some texture, because the photograph itself has a little bit of shadow. But if we look carefully at one of the edges, uh, and let me actually type zoom and then S for selected so that we can orbit around this object. If we look carefully at one of those edges, it's a perfectly flat edge, which means it's a perfectly flat plane. Okay, So it's really just visual right now. So if I were to render it and you were far enough away from it, it would look kind of like wood shingles and that would probably be sufficient. But if I got close to it or I wanted to do any kind of a detailed rendering of the edge, it wouldn't really stand out much. So the first thing that we need to do is we would need to add some wood grain texture because the shingles themselves have a little bit of wood grain texture to them. So that brings up our next piece. So this top one here, let me use a pen. I know this is going to be very crude, but um, just so that we can keep track of this here. Let me make my brush a little bit smaller. This top one here is the diffuse. So I'm going to just say diff. Excuse my terrible Photoshop writing here. So this is the diffuse map right here, which is essentially a photograph. The next one down here is something called a bump map. And what a bump map does is, and if we look at this a little bit closer, I know it's not the highest quality image, you can see that it has some little ripples in it. Okay, So I'll show you how to create this bump map, but the job of the bump map is to provide some small grain texture across the surface, so it's not perfectly flat as a surface. If we look at almost any surface, unless it's like a smooth, glossy, or a metal surface, there's going to be some texture to it. And this texture is going to be the bump. And so if I were to turn on the bump, I turned it off initially um, for this particular piece. If I were to take the bump and turn it back on, we can immediately see in the render preview, well, you guys can't see it as well as I can on the screen, uh, but there's some wood grain texture that wasn't there before. So if we look at the edge, though, it's still perfectly flat along the edge, but we're getting a little bit of wood grain texture. So that's, the, that's the, the next piece of the puzzle, is to give ourselves a little bit of that wood grain texture. And I'm going to go through this several times so that you're going to see this over a variety of different materials. Then we go back into Photoshop, and let me press Control-0 so we can jump out here. So I have my diffuse, I have my bump. This next one here, and I think it's easiest to see along the edge, you see we start to get those characteristic tapers of a shingle. And so this one is different, and it's called a displacement map. So I'm going to write disp for displacement. And this displacement map, the job of that is to provide large-scale jumps in texture. So if we have a shingle and the thickness of the base of the shingle or the butt of the shingle is a half of an inch, for example, we want to be able to have the wall have a taper out to a half inch, come back, and go out to a half inch, and come back again. So in that scenario, I would load up my uh, displacement map, and I will do it right here as well. I would turn that on, and once that's on, well, it's not giving us a preview of it, so I'm going to actually have to render it out. So bear with me for a second while we render it. And so as I look at this, I know it's turning out too light, but you can see that I get these little jumps as part of the material. So I didn't, in this scenario, if I was modeling a wall that had this shingle siding to it, I wouldn't actually have to model each of those shingles. I could say, take this surface and apply this pattern on it where it sticks out and goes back. So it's a really effective way of creating a, a nice, realistic looking texture. And you can see, I know the, the render quality here is poor because my light settings aren't right, but you can see that it's really doing a good job of giving me that real big scale relief. 
So there's really two pieces to texture in a material. And one is the bump, which is the fine texture. And the second is the displacement map, which is the large jumps in texture. So for example, in a brick siding, something like that, we'd have the brick and then we'd have, and it would have a surface on it. That surface would be determined by bump, the little you know, uh, brick texture. And then the grout uh, or the mortar would be part of the displacement because we'd want that to step back. Okay, so let me use another example here um, to kind of illustrate the point. You can see that in this little setup here, the diffuse, the bump, the displacement, and finally they all come together to make that uh, last piece. So another example here is a sheet metal corrugated siding. So we start with, and I should probably do the, the, uh, this live for you guys as well here. Let me stop that. And let me go into my V-Ray options here. I'm actually going to change, while I'm here, I'm going to change the uh, exposure value a little bit so it's not quite so bright. Uh, and then let me load in that um, metal texture. So it's under the sheet metal. I think I have it under siding. Yeah, there it is. So we'll go ahead and load that. I'm going to apply that to... Do this, uh, nope, that's not what I want to do. All right, now it's on that. So if I were to, and this one I'm going to have to actually render it for you guys to see it. Let me start with turning off those two. Uh, the displacement and the bump. So in this scenario, it has just the photograph of the corrugated steel right here. The bump texture, this next one down, it's steel. It's pretty darn flat. There's not a lot of surface texture. So we probably don't even need the bump really to provide too much surface texture because it's virtually smooth. It's metal to begin with. The one that's critical is the displacement. So we need to create this wave pattern so that the texture looks realistic. And we do that using that displacement map. So if I were to turn that back on, let me turn on the displacement and the bump. It looks like I have a little bit of a bump map on it. And then we could go ahead and, and step back a little bit and perform a rendering of this, I hope. And there you go, we can start to see those in and outs, those undulations of the steel. It looks like I might not have the, um, the settings quite right for how deep it should be, um, et cetera, but you guys get the idea of what that displacement map would be, right? So we, we've talked about bump map and we've talked about displacement map quite a lot. What we haven't talked about is what happens if one of your materials, instead of having these pieces, has some transparency. So in this scenario, it's again just a, a sheet of metal that we're working with here, but we want to take that sheet of metal and we want to perforate it with a bunch of holes. So the, the third type of map that we can apply is something called the transparency map. There you go, transparency map. That's going to control what is a hole and what is solid. And so we have that. It doesn't mean that we're stuck with doing just one or the other. So here's another example here with a mesh where we have the mesh as a photograph that tiles. Then we have something that provides, I think in this case it's a displacement. So we have just a little bit of actual thickness to the material. Then we have a transparency map that tells it where to cut it out. And then we end up with the final material at the bottom. So I could load any one of those into this same file, uh, either one of those, and apply uh, to my material here, uh, to my object, and we get that same transparency. So let's talk about what actually makes up these pieces to begin with. So let's look inside one of these files. I'm going to go back to that shingled one first. 
and we're going to look at what pieces make it up. So I'll open up, um, again, I'm going to work on this particular file from my flash drive because it has a good set of illustrations for us. Let me go into my resources folder and then V-Ray, and I'm going to go into siding, and I'm going to go into that shingle siding here, and we're going to look up what makes it up. So we have our vismat file that allows us to load the file in the first place, but as we look at it, there's three files that are relevant here. The first file is the diffuse, and if, if the person who created the material was careful when they were creating the material, they named these in an appropriate manner so you can tell the difference. Sometimes somebody creates the material and they're like one, two, and three, and you have to decide which one is which. So in this scenario, I made the material, so yes, they're, they're labeled correctly. Let me go ahead and open these files in Photoshop, if it'll let me. It probably won't. It's classic. There we go, just so you can see them a little bit better. So this file here is the photograph of the shingles. So it's just the plain photographs of the shingles itself. Then we move to the bump file. And the bump file is actually pretty easy to create. What we're doing is we're creating a black and white version of the same color file because the black generally is a little bit of the texture. If we create a high contrast black and white, we get that little surface texture out of it. And I'll show you how to create all of these. Now the third piece is a little bit harder. And that is that we're using a gradient where black uh, and actually, I think this one might be opposite. I think this is technically what it's supposed to look like. And sometimes I do them opposite and I forget. And then you can, there's a checkbox for invert later on. So if you end up doing it backwards, it doesn't really matter. But essentially what you're doing is you're picking what is the high point and what is the low point, And then you're creating a gradient from high to low. It could be a, a stark contrast where we have just one and then the other. Or it could be, in this case, it's a taper because it's sloping uh, where it's a gradient. And so the idea here is that the highest point is at a half inch. That's that white edge there. The lowest point is all the way at the back here, where it's underneath these two overlapping shingles. That's black. And so I'm going from the high point to the low point in each one of these little shingles. It takes work to create this, but at the end, you end up with a really nice uh, texture. Uh, sometimes it's easier to see. Let me open another uh, material here. another one of the sightings when I'm talking about this uh, displacement, I have a Borden Batten sighting, which, let me open these two. Come on. Of course not, right? Uh, so let, well, let me talk about it right here. So this is where you have a, a board that's on the wall, and then you have another board laying on top of it. So if we look at the displacement, it's a really simple one. The black is the lower board. There we go. So we can see there's the board, there's the batten on top, there's the board, there's the batten on top. The board would be black and the batten would be white because they just separate by you know half, three quarters of an inch. So there's no gradient to it because it's not sloping. It's just one piece versus the other. So when we go to create one of these materials in the first place, we have to figure out what all of these files represent. And like I said, I'm going to talk you through how to create one completely from scratch in Photoshop, but for the purposes of you guys kind of digesting this and, and, and learning how to do this, I'm going to suggest going to a website that's called vraymaterials.co.uk. And I did pull the website up this morning, so it was working. It works on Wi-Fi. It just doesn't work here. There we go. So um, in this, in this, this is a, a bunch of V-Ray materials, and um, all of these materials, though, are set up for V-Ray for 3D Studio Max, not for V-Ray for Rhino. So we can adapt any one of these to represent a V-Ray for Rhino material. The reason that I like this is, uh, and again, I'm not, adding, I'm, I'm not asking you to, uh, to buy any of these, so you, can only, you only need to use the free ones. But on this one, for example, I'm going to download this uh, multi-wood cladding. We could take a look at what files are included with it. So let me go ahead and extract them all.
And if I look at it, ah, this person did a great job of, of uh, naming these. So I have a diffuse right there, which is my color. Then I have a displacement. This is, the, remember, the, the contrast between dark and light. The low area is going to be black. The high areas are going to be white. And then it looks like that's all they've given me, is the diffuse and the displacement. So we could probably take this even a step further. And then we have the rendered together piece of what it looks like. So if we wanted to recreate this material brand new in uh, V-Ray for Rhino, we're just going to use these two files to help set up this particular material. So let's talk about how those would go into uh, play here. So I'm going to go ahead and switch back over into my um, V-Ray and Rhino here. And I'm going to go into my materials and I'm going to create a brand new material in the V-Ray Asset Editor. When I click on New Material, I'm going to choose just a genetic, ge genetic, a generic material. And we'll go ahead and rename this. This was like wood planks. We'll call it wood planks rough right there. It's showing up as just the gray default material. So remember, I need to bring in those, um, the color or the photograph of what it looks like. That first one here, when I have my wood planks rough material, I'm going to open up the diffuse category. And instead of picking a color like we've done before, I actually want to pick a picture. And I'll do that by clicking the, the black and white checkerboard here next to where it says diffuse. So I'll click on that. And then I can go to create a bitmap or to pick a bitmap. And then I need to go to my downloads folder, and there was their diffuse. It looks like they created just a colored file, not a, uh, an actual photograph. Again, it's based on what they created to, to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and use that as my map. We'll go ahead and go to back. And so now we can see that that is now applied to my material. Let me, while we're here, I'm going to go ahead and apply this to the selection in the background so we can see it. All right, so there it is, applied. Now, the next piece that they gave us in this download was one that they called dif uh, displacement, which was this file. This one, to me, could be displacement. It also could very easily be a bump map, and we might end up using it as both. Um, but I'll show you how to load it in as a bump map uh, first. Well, I'll, I'll do it as a diffuse uh, displacement map, sorry. So. I'm here back in my material. I'm going to come down here to the maps section. So I worked in this upper section, and now I'm going to move to the map section. And right here, I have bump or normal mapping, and I also have displacement mapping. Let me expand displacement mapping. I will turn it on. And the first thing that it's going to ask for is where's my picture? So under this, I want to choose that picture. So I'll click on that checkerboard pattern again. I'll choose bitmap again, and I'm going to choose the um, displacement map right there. Oops, sorry. The displacement map right there. I'll go ahead and say open. There it is. I can then click on back. Now, right here under amount, I can choose how much I want this to stand out. This is the difference in whatever your default units are in from the, the surface itself to the high point, if that makes sense. So if I wanted it to be a half inch, I would type 0 0.5 here. So there it is at 0 0.5. We can see a little preview of it. And again, it's not showing in the, the full version here. So in order to test it, I would need to do a, a test render. So I click on render. And again, I'm having some uh, sun rendering issues, so it's turning out too light. So in this scenario, we can see that I'm creating the groove and I'm creating the wood texture. But I think in both instances, they're not um, the the texture is too much, and the groove is is not very pronounced. So I don't know that this would necessarily be the best example of a high quality texture. So I think 
that rather than using it as a displacement map, I think I would rather use it as a bump map. So I'm going to turn the bump map on, and I'm going to choose the bitmap file. So even though it's called displacement, I'm going to use it as a bump map. And there it is. And now if we look at the preview, yeah, it looks a lot better. It looks like the wood texture. So I'm going to click on back. We have the ability to change the amount. I'm going to leave it at one. You can change it if you want. This is not tied to your default units. So it's not about the distance anymore. So at that point, I could go back and I could re-render it. Again, I'm, I'm struggling with my uh, render settings here. We'll try that. And I know this one's a little bit dark. Let me just stop it and re-render that again. I'm guessing at the render settings to try to get it right. Now, in this scenario, it looks a lot better. It looks like just the wood texture. So it's working better as a bump map than it was as a true displacement map. If I wanted to add more of a jump in between each of these boards, I could. I would just go in and create the black and white file. And maybe I'll do that as an example in a little bit. OK? So let's go back to the V-Ray materials here. And let's look for one that has some transparency to it. Clearly, their website doesn't like me. Maybe we just killed their website. <laughs> um, anyway, well, why don't I switch over for now, and I'll actually go through creating a material from scratch instead. Um, like I said, I, I kind of apologize that um, I, this isn't working, but you guys get the idea of how this stuff comes in. Let me go the full process all the way through creating it in Photoshop. But again, like I said, this is a little bit heavier in Photoshop, but it starts to tell you what makes a, a, up a good material. So I need to start with creating the, uh, or finding an image for the material in the first place. Now, in an ideal sense, you just walk out and you take a picture of that material, but sometimes you can't find the material that you're really wanting to create. Uh, so that's where searching the web comes in. You want a really high quality image to start with. So I'm going to use, uh, rather than use the Creative Commons search, I'm going to use a website called Unsplash, uh, which is all free to use images. And they're generally really high quality. And then I'll put in something uh, like, uh, how about wood texture? Or maybe sighting. That's a little too close. Let's try sighting. wood siding maybe, something like that. And so as I'm looking through here, I'm looking for a material that I'd like to kind of use as, as siding. Um, the closer to orthogonal it is, the easier it would be to work with. So something like this that has the arc to it is going to be really hard to flatten out. So I would stay away from something like that. And be picky about it. Spend some time actually scrolling and, uh, and looking. The other thing to be careful of is like this, for example, that has the peeling paint. While it might seem appealing, as soon as I create a tiling texture out of this, that big blister of paint is going to repeat over and over. So it's going to have a really telltale pattern. So you want something without major patterns to it. I'm failing miserably at finding something good. Part of the reason I never script these 
is because I always want to do it live so that you guys realize that it's not just as simple as, oh, here's that perfect image that you start from. Uh, let's try something different. Let's try uh, uh, wood decking. So even something like this with the moss on it, see how it's got those patterns that would end up repeating? That's, that's going to be problematic down the road. Come on, give me something. Well, I wasn't going to do brick, but maybe brick is what it's going to be. Oh. Come on, give me something. There we go. I knew I'd find something eventually, right? We'll do this one. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and download that image. Uh, like that's why I said I like this because um, they down uh, the downloads are all free. You don't have to sign up or anything. And I'm going to go ahead and open that image in Photoshop. So let me go to File and then Open, and I'm going to go into my downloads, and I'll open that image that I just downloaded. There it is. Um, so if you want to perform any edits to the original image, you of course can do that, um, much like you would to try to kind of enhance the image. To me, this image looks a little bit dark, so I am going to do an adjustment layer. I'm going to go to Layer, New Adjustment Layers. I'm just going to do a Levels Adjustment to it. And if you were in my 135 class, you should be familiar with doing the Levels Adjustment. Um, let's get rid of that. And let me just pull that over a little bit. Oh, let's pull this back a little bit. Just trying to brighten the image up. So as I look at this particular image, there's obviously there's a few repeating patterns. There's the nails or the screws. And on each one of these, there's a few other little repeating patterns. This right there would be problematic long term. It's possible that that little spot right there would be problematic. So I may end up doing something that's only a couple of boards thick, or I may concentrate just on this piece. The problem is concentrating on this piece, we have to think about how the nail holes line up each time. So a couple things to be aware of. Uh, if you think before you crop, you'll have a better uh, chance of getting it right. Let me go into my layers, or excuse me, let me go into my rulers. So let me go to view and then show. Oh, let me just click on rulers there. There we go. That's just going to allow me to drag a straight line. So I can kind of test to see how straight is that line right there. That's pretty straight. That one looks pretty straight. Yeah, okay, so this one's already shot pretty well uh, straight. Sometimes you get an image that is not so straight. That you need to straighten. Let me, there's one back up here. There we go. So like this one, where it's in perspective, um, you could still work with this particular image. And let me open that one up just so you can see that one as well. So this one's still attractive, uh, and it would make a good deck, but obviously I can't tile this image because they're, they're all converging. So in order to use this, I would still need to use these straight lines to kind of help guide it, but I would go in and let me right click to, to create a layer from background so I can work on the image itself. And then I'd have to use the skew tool. So I'd go into my um, free transform and I'd go to skew. And what I'd be doing is trying to straighten out these lines a bit. And that would need to straighten out. Sometimes you can use the edge of the page a little bit to help you straighten it out. 
something like that. I'm not going to use all of it. I'm concentrating just on the very center. Of the image file. And this one might have too much curvature in it to really get it. But I wanted to point out that you can adjust uh, to try to get it flat. This one still looks like it has a little too much curvature to it, so I don't know that that's necessarily the best example. I'm going to jump back to this one for right now. And now, I know this one's already pretty straight, so I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I want to think about when I crop it, where I want to do the crops to make it easy for this pattern to repeat. So if I were to pick, for example, the center of this board, that would be a pretty easy spot to heal. In, if I instead picked, let me back up here for a second, one of the grooves, that also could be a spot to heal, but if I was slightly off, it might be a little bit more uh, challenging to fix. The other thing is, though, that that little groove is nice and dark, so I can hide a lot in there if it's not quite right. So it really could work either way. Um, I'll try the groove and let's see what happens. Now the other thing is I don't want to crop it so that I get all the way, we'll stop there, with this set of screws and that set of screws because when these two combine together, I'd have two screws really close together. So I want to think about if there's you know, that amount of distance to this set of screws, I would want up here at the top to stop it so that the distance from here to the screws would be similar from the distance from here to the screws. Does that make sense? So I'm trying to create that about right. I don't like, like I said, I don't like this little piece here. So I'm going to pull this one over and we'll do it maybe in that groove. The other thing that helps is if this groove right there also lands on that groove there. I wouldn't want to crop it like halfway through a board. That wouldn't look right. So we'll make it land in that groove right there. And I'm going to shorten this one up just a whisker, which might mean that one needs to get a little bit longer. So right about like that. So I've thought carefully about how I'm doing this cropping. And I end up with this. I'm also, since I'm here, I'm going to rotate this canvas. So let me rotate the canvas uh, 90 degrees counterclockwise just so that I'm looking at it horizontally. It just gives me a little more screen real estate to work with rather than seeing it vertical. Okay, so I have this set up and I'm ready to create a tiling texture out of this. There is a separate set of instructions on the course website that talks about this process. So if you get a little bit lost, you can look at the tutorials. I forget which one it is. I probably reference it here. 1.22 for tiling texture. Okay, let me get back here to this page. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a command called the offset, um, or the filter called an offset filter. But before I can do that, I need to one, release the background layer. So let me right click and say layer from background. And two, it would be helpful if I had a general idea of how large this image is. So just for reference, I'm going to go to image and then image size and just take a note of how many pixels it is. So it's about 5,000 pixels by about 2,500 pixels. Doesn't matter how uh, accurate that is, but approximately. Now when I go to use the filter and then other and then offset, when I go filter other offset, what it's going to do is it's going to slice up this image. And when it slices it, it's going to take one half and glue it over on the other half. So I'm going to use the uh, the vertical slice, sorry, the horizontal slice, slice first, so that hopefully you can see it. The seam is right there. Now if I did a careful job of cropping it, it should be pretty hard to tell where that seam is. But sometimes it's a little bit more obvious. So it's there. So what I'm looking at for these values is about half of what my image size was. So I want this to be about 2500 and I want this one to be about 1350. And what I've done is I've cut the image so that this edge is always going to seam perfectly with that edge. This edge is always going to seam perfectly with that edge. So the only thing I have to quote fix is the line here and the line that goes across right there in the middle of that groove. That one's already pretty well resolved. I've got a faint line right in there that needs to be fixed. In order to fix that, I'm going to use my clone stamp tool. So I'll come back here to clone stamp. I'm going to zoom in a bit. 
And the clone stamp tool allows us to basically copy from one area. It's like a rubber stamp. I can copy it from one area and make it go. So I could copy, for example, that. So I hold down Alt to set a target. And I could put that piece of dirt anywhere I wanted to put it. Obviously, I don't want to pick, pick the piece of dirt. So I'm going to copy the um, groove here. And I'm going to slowly blend those grooves together. Same thing here. I'm going to hold down Alt to copy that. And we're going to blend those two grooves together right about like that. Go down to this next one, Alt, Copy From. And we'll blend that one together. Last one here, we need to blend that together a little bit as well. Go back up to the top. Same thing where we kind of need to blend that together about like that. Hard to tell the difference in here, so this one's not too bad, though I might take just a little bit with a very soft brush. There we go, it's nice and soft. Copy from one side. Maybe just a little bit to kind of break up that transition so you don't see that line as much. Same thing here, just try to break up that line. Sometimes you copy a little bit from both sides to make that line go away. Oops. That, you can see I copied that piece of dirt. Let's get rid of that piece of dirt like that. If there's any uh, repeating patterns that you really don't like, you could get rid of them. If I didn't like that uh, little streak there, we could come in here and we could get rid of that little streak. If we didn't like that little piece of tape, we could get rid of that little piece of tape. You guys get the idea. So if I press Control-0 now, we have a texture that would tile in all directions. So that is my diffuse map for this particular texture. So I'd go ahead and I'd say File, um, let me go to Export. And I'm going to export it as a JPEG. So let me just go to Export As. Come on. Uh, OK, all of that's good. I'm going to go ahead and click on Export All. Let me create a new folder. I think this is metal decking, but OK. And then we will call this uh, diffuse, because that's that image file. There it is. So now, if I jump back into V-Ray for a second, come back here, I can go back into my V-Ray materials. We can create a brand new material. This material is going to be decking metal. And I need to assign the diffuse map. So I'll open up the diffuse drawer here, click on my map, choose a bitmap. And I will choose that diffuse material. There it is. I can apply it to the shapes here. Let me right click and say apply to selection. And now we're seeing that decking applied to my uh, shapes. Now, it currently has no bump map and it has no, um, it has no uh, diffuse or displacement map just yet. So I have to create those as well. So let's go back to Photoshop. And so the bump map, the, the surface texture, is just a high contrast black and white version of this same image. So I already have the image. We're just going to go into Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and this is going to be a Levels Adjustment. And we could even call this Bump for clarity here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pull the black value in, and we're going to pull the white value in, so we have some real 
high contrast little speckles there, something like that. So it's high, high contrast black and white. And then we'll save that. Um, we also, it's not really black and white, so let's convert it to black and white. I'll go to layer, new adjustment layer. I'm going to do a channel mixer. And I'm going to convert that over into monochrome. So we're really seeing it just as a black and white image. I can then go ahead and go to file, export, export all, or excuse me, export as. Settings are already set. This is, instead of being diffuse, is going to be the bump. And we'll click on save. There we go. Now when I jump back over into Rhino, in this same metal siding here, we're going to come down to maps. And we're going to go to bump. We're going to turn it on and assign it that bitmap that I just created, which is the bump. And now we should have a little bit of texture on the surface of that. So you can see that texture start to, start to show up. And we could run a, a render in the background so we could see a little bit higher version while I work on the displacement. So there's that. It's working on, on rendering. Now I need to look over back at my Photoshop file and decide, let me turn off that bump here. There we go. And decide which Where's, where's my starting point? How far up do I go? And then how far up do I go? So in, in this image, I see three real levels. I see the darkest black between the, the, the boards. I see the medium level being the boards themselves. And I see the high point being all of these little dots that are sticking up, the screws that are sticking up. So I would want to create a gradient for those three pieces. So uh, we're going to start thinking about filling in um, the, the boards themselves. And we have kind of two, two ways of going about doing this. Uh, one way would be to create a, zoom out here, I'm going to create a little selection here, right along where that groove would be. And then I'm going to use the gradient tool which is available under, it's right here, to create a gradient. The gradient type that I want is that one. So as you look across here, I'm trying to go black to white to black, essentially, as I create this. So now that I have that, I need a new layer to paint the gradient on. I need my foreground and background color to be black and white. And actually, it shouldn't be black and white. It should be black and gray. So I really should have a 50% or maybe a 70% gray. No, let's do it lighter. It should be like a 30% gray. There we go. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a gradient that goes from dark to gray, right where that is. The, the longer that I draw this line, the longer it takes to transition. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to do from the very center right to the edge so that I get where the black is, and then it's going to come up. And because it's a gradient, it's going to curve over to the top rather than having an abrupt step. So I have that placed there. I need to repeat this across each one of these pieces. Sometimes it's useful just to go ahead and copy it. So I'll control C and then control V. I can then use move. Oops, sorry. And I can move this one to that position. Oops, did it not? Ah, I made a bad selection. Let me back up for a second. See that selection didn't quite get all the way to the edge. Let me make sure that I actually get all the way to the edge because that would be problematic. I'm going to tighten this up just a little bit. Right about there. OK, so let me try that gradient tool again. Let me zoom in. I'm going to go right from the dead center. 
So that creates the gradient for me. I'll press control zero so I can zoom back out. Then I'm going to copy this control C. Then I'll press control V to paste it. I can then move that copy up to this joint. Oh, tell me I can't win today. Apparently I need that to go all the way from one side across to the other side. There we go. Let's try that gradient one more time. And that's about right. Control C, Control V to create that copy. Let's move the copy up until it's right over that groove might be helpful to change the opacity so you can determine exactly where it is. But I also know that I'm pretty close to it. So we'll go right about there. Last ones need to go halfway. Right about there. And one more at the bottom. So make sure you don't forget the top and the, the very top and the bottom because they have to transition as well. It might be helpful to turn off the image so you can start to see what's happening here. There we go. So I have those pieces. I need to fill in in between those pieces. But before I do that, let me merge them together. So I'll select all of those layers that I just created. I'll go up to layer and then merge layers. Um, merge layers. There we go. They're all one. And now I can go ahead and fill in. So I'll use my magic wand to make the selection. I'm going to hold down shift to select each one. I'll flip my colors and I will paint with that 30% gray. Right like that. So it's very similar to the piece that I created first. The difference is that this is just black to gray. And the last piece would be for everywhere there's one of these little dots, we'd create a little white circle. So I'd come in here, let me, and I could get more specific because there's a little line for the screwdriver, but we're not going that quite that far. Um, so let me go ahead and create a little circle. Let me use the ellipse tool. One of the tricks, by the way, with getting the circles right, if you're struggling to get the circle perfect, is to start on your circle where you think. So if you, if you drew an imaginary line here and here, you want to start right about where that is. Drag the circle going this direction. When you get the bottom of the circle right, even if the top's not quite right, let go and then start and drag back the other direction. And within two or three marquee selections, you get the perfect circle if you go back and forth because you'll end up getting to the right place. Um, so once you have that selection, we would go ahead and we'd paint that in pure white. And let me go ahead and create a brand new layer up here. And we paint that in pure white. Then I could copy it. I could paste it. Nope. Sorry, I need the layer itself. No. Hold on a second. I must have. There we go. And then I'm just going to place this over the top of all of those little screw holes. So 
So it does take a little bit of time to get it right, but if you spend your time, uh, once you get it, it'll be a really nice texture for you. Almost there. Sometimes it's helpful to use the arrow keys to help these line up. All right, so I have all of those. Uh, the next piece that I need is to turn on my gradients, but my gradients. Um, Turn this off. It's actually there, there, but it's really hard to see the difference between it's there and there. I don't even know if you can see it on the screen. No, you can't. I can see it. Um, so anyway, there's a subtle difference there so that those will stick up a little bit. Uh, now I can save this. Let me go to File and then uh, Export, Export As. And this one is not going to be the diffuse. It's not going to be the the, the bump, it's going to be the displacement. So there's displacement. I can click Save. Perfect. And then when I go back to Rhino, and there it is with the texture on it, I can add in that displacement. So here I am with my metal decking. And then let me turn on displacement. It's going to be a bitmap. I'm going to choose the displacement. And then I also need to choose how much. So it's probably more like a quarter of an inch or so. Once that's set, I can close it and then we'll re-render and you'll see, especially right on that edge, there'll be more of a dip. So we'll go ahead and go back to Rhino here. Let's zoom in a little bit so we can see it. And then we'll go ahead and render it again. And you'll see it right along that particular edge. So the transparency map works the same way. If I wanted, um, instead of having all those circles that I created, if I wanted all of those circles to be um, holes where they're punching through, I could do that as well. Um, let me, I'm going to use that as my, my argument place here because, oh, there we go. Sorry, I had my, uh, my adjustments on, and that was causing this not to turn out. Let me go ahead and uh, resave this. Better contrast between these. All right, let me go back over into Rhino. There you go, you can see that little jump down there and there. So let me open up my V-Ray. Uh-oh, it doesn't like me. Um, and I'm going to swap it out for that. But in the meantime, let me show you about the transparency. So in this scenario, all I need is wherever it needs to be transparent, I need that to be different than the background. So I'm going to create a new background file and put it underneath all of those dots that I just created. I will select it all and then I will paint all of it in black. All right, so I'm going to make those little circles transparent. 
I would go to File and then Save as, Export, Export As. And again, this one would be a hypothetical because the screws would obviously be there. They would be holes through. But you guys would get the idea of what I'm talking about here. Let me export all. And this would be transparency. I lost the render behind, so I don't want you guys to have to sit and, and wait for me to do that. But I will do a test so you can see it where the holes have been punched through. Um, so I'll let you guys go ahead and get started. I know that was a lot to take in, uh, but uh, start with the vraymaterials.co.uk. Use some of their example materials to try to work through it. Stay away from things like glass or with heavy transparency. Today is really about solid wall type materials more than anything else. Um, so stick stick away from that for right now. Are there any questions? Yeah. Then if they just uh, give the dot mat file, then it doesn't have any um, associated displacement. Um, so just pick a different one. All right. So I'll let you guys go ahead and post. We're looking for about four materials today for you to go through and create it. There is a sample file for you to download. Um, you can work through the the. The settings. Oh, the one other thing is how do you package everything up? Because these are all referenced files. Uh, it used to be this is one thing that they completely messed up. Oh, is it not going to let me do it? Because this is locked out. No, it's, it's going to let me do it. Good. Um, they used to let us just pack the materials, where we gather everything. We don't have that option anymore, so we have to manually pack our materials. So when you're creating it, once you create, like this is the decking that I like. I have it named. I'm going to click on the save icon. And this is going to allow me to save this material settings. There it is. So I'll put this on my flash drive in today's folder. There it is. And I'm going to call it decking.metal. Uh, dot VR mat, which is the updated, it used to be vismat, now it's VR mat. I'll go ahead and click on save. Those are the settings that go with it, but it's not the images themselves. So if you want the images themselves, or you want this material to work later on, you need more than that file. So I'd go into my um, folder for today, and you notice that I put everything in one file anyway. So there's my uh, VR mat. Here's my bump, diffuse, display. Actually, I can get rid of this one. There's my displacement. And that, that was my transparency if I were doing it. And I would take all of those and I would zip that file. So I'd go to send to compressed zip folder. And that'll make a nice little zip. That's what I would like you to upload in addition to the sample file that shows what the rendering looks like in case somebody down the road wanted to use your particular material. There is a categories section so you can categorize your material to help organize it so other people can find it. Uh, all of these materials also exist on the course website. So if you're looking for a material and you can't find it online, you can always go into the V-Ray materials library. There are a bunch that are sorted. You know, there's a bunch of different bricks, for example. Anything that you find with the Digital Tools logo on it is something that I've worked on or touched or, or, or made sure is, is going to be a pretty good material for you. So you can be pretty safe with those.